Dreamscapes, Eclipses, Twin Identities, Godhood, Swords, Trees. This doesn't even make any sense now, I'm just saying random sh**. Air Conditioner. 16.6 million copies of Elden Ring were sold a mere four months after its launch. This is impressive for two reasons. It shows that a successful game isn't always required to lead its players by the hand, and it shows that a minimum of 16.6 million people in the world anchor at least some part of their self-worth around how cute they can make their face look with a graphics engine that could barely render stones on a sidewalk without crying. And when a game like this ascends to this level of popularity, eventually people are going to want more of it. All it took was attaching two DLCs to Dark Souls 3, and it ended up staying in the sphere of community interest a, a little longer than it probably should have. Or instead of waiting for a DLC, close down those damn tabs you have open all the time, and Elden Ring will practically run like a whole new game. Or just download Opera GX so you never have to do that again. And thanks to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Uh... In case that wasn't obvious. Opera GX is a browser that consumes considerably less memory than other browsers, meaning if you want to play a graphically demanding game while listening to podcasts or whatever the hell you guys do, you can just leave everything open like normal. The panel lets users put a limit on how much CPU or RAM they want their browsers to use, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest, it actually makes quite a massive difference. Like, this is... This is insane, what I'm looking at right now. Like, this is stupidly good. It's also the only browser I've ever used with this amount of customization. Like, this Medieval GX mod has background music whenever you open a tab... ...or type... ...or do anything, really. It can actually feel overwhelming at first, but after a couple minutes, I finally decided on this weird Cyber Psychosis shader mod that changes your entire screen. It's pretty badass. Downloading mods is insanely easy. No matter what page you're on, you can go to the left sidebar and click Mods, then scroll down to click on the Store tab, and you're there. And I, I know it says Store, but most of these are free. Don't worry, you don't need to pay for anything. It even has an importing tool that allows you to keep all the previous settings and bookmarks and stuff you had on your previous browser so you don't lose any of them. But the most impressive thing you get when you download Opera GX through my link, and I can't believe they made this, is an exclusive feature in your GX corner that keeps you up to date with the 12 latest uploads on my channel. No longer any need to ring the bell to be notified anymore. Tell that bell to go fuck itself with Opera GX today by downloading the browser from my link below. I really hope they allow me to end the plug like that. Character buffs in Elden Ring are offered to you in the form of talismans, and although things like spells and great hammers are usually the fun parts of exploring builds, your talisman setup is likely going to be your gamer fuel, your inner strength, so to speak. There's 91 in total, including the entwining cord that changes your character's posture, and although it's a pretty comprehensive selection that gives benefits to just about every playstyle you can think of, it does kind of feel like a few talismans are missing. The heirloom family, for instance, misses out on an extremely important arcane-themed talisman. The status defense talismans, which are the horn charms, only extend to plus one variants, and for Deathblight there are just two different talismans named Prince of Death's Pustule and Prince of Death's Cyst. Talismans are already pretty expansive as is, but I think a lot of people over time have started to feel like there could be missing gaps the talismans don't cover that could really open things up a bit and make the combat loop more exciting. Some talismans don't even have upgraded variants, most of them are just a one and done deal that offers you a single random buff that's useful maybe 10% of the time and then says fuck off, that's all you're getting. Like, I I don't know what anyone else's opinion on this might be, but would it have, like, killed you to just slap in a blessed do plus one or something? There's a talisman that enhances your damage with throwing pots, there's one that silences footsteps so you can solid snake past whoever you want, and there's even one that's only specific to roars and breath-themed attacks. Most of these are extremely niche, which is kind of the point. But if I actually sat you down and told you that I would pay off your mortgage if you could give me one reason why the perfumer's talisman exists, I don't think you could do it. The great shield talisman is useful on just about everything except except great shields, and any talisman that only procs on full HP or low HP is extremely unreliable on the best of days. Point is, the talisman system feels a little incomplete, I guess? I always felt like the concept of exaltation talismans could help with other status afflictions like madness and sleep, which seems fitting for a sleep-themed demigod being a likely encounter. Different species of enemies also exist, like dragons, omens, those who live in death, misbegotten, all of which are begging to be exploited with a talisman that gives a damage bonus against certain enemies of that type. Maybe a great hammer talisman that's functionally just a plus one iteration of the regular hammer talisman. I, I don't know where this is all coming from, no one even asked 
ask for any of these ideas. Who cares? Point is, the talisman system feels complete enough as is, but the size of this DLC is probably going to be the largest we've ever played in a Souls game, and I'd like to think a good amount of time is being invested into making this system even better than it already is. And speaking of dragon enemies, how about we start putting that clarifying horn charm to work, huh? Where's my fucking frenzy dragon? We all know he's coming. Where is he from, Soft? His name is Arthur, and he's really well behaved. I just got him potty trained too, so if this DLC launches and I find out you've fucked up his feeding schedule, I'm gonna file- Dragons in these types of games have always been somewhat of a spectacle for me. I grew up being obsessed with dinosaurs like most young boys in my generation did. So when I figured out people were busy concepting dinosaurs that could breathe fire and just throwing them into their movies, eight-year-old me practically shit his pants. Dragons are just cool. Moreover, dragons have been improved greatly in FromSoft's games as time has went on. We went from having dragons that just flew up in the air and tanked your frame rate to dragons that launched magic missiles, freezing swords, had four heads, practiced fucking Tai Chi or whatever this move is. If I had known what a precursor Dark Eater Madeir actually was for the sheer excellence this studio had prepared for us down the line, 21-year-old me would have practically shit his pants. I can't exactly say how well well, the idea of a sleep status dragon would translate over to actual gameplay, as I think part of the issue with sleep in the base game is the lack of impact it has when anything with even a slight resistance to it is affected by it in a PvE situation. Most enemies kinda just look like they're attending a college lecture and almost fall asleep for like three seconds before the professor notices and asks them to answer a question. Yet in the Colosseum, fighting against a sleep build is uniquely demoralizing, to the point where unplugging the router is a genuine reflex you have as soon as you see the color purple. I think if the way sleep affected players was a bit less movement inhibiting, I'd probably use it a bit more. Mikola is supposed to be able to brainwash his followers, right? Maybe implement mind control in a way that makes you forget you have magic or skills, and so once the effect procs, those abilities become deactivated for like 20 seconds or something. I don't know, it would still be annoying, but at least you would retain a bit of player control. That would also give us a new window into approaching the avenue of sleep magic or charm magic or whatever direction they're going to take with it. Sleep just sounds like a really hard class of magic to make, and I honestly hope I'm not getting myself psyched up for no reason. Part of me feels like a lot of the spectacle is gonna come down from how sleep is used against you and not the other way around. I can't wait to see all the different crabs we're gonna encounter. Actually, that's- okay, that's obviously a joke, but I wonder if that could end up becoming like a recurring theme where animals that look docile end up breathing sleep mist at you as soon as you turn your back. I'm also personally looking forward to if and how they spend a little more time maturing the bewitching branch idea and coming up with potential weapon skills and spells that involve mind jacking weaker enemies and making them fight for you and stuff. The item itself is unique enough to have its own particle effect that looks unlike any other and I just feel like it's too cool an item to not be expanded upon in some regard. Yet there are barely any in the game at all. A spell variant of this would be compatible with a lot of different tools that are already in the game like the old lord its talisman, so it's not like there isn't room for these spells somewhere in the game to exist. I don't know, hope is a dangerous thing to have in today's society. But as underutilized as the sleep status is in the vanilla game, I'd be quite surprised if it was something they didn't expand upon. I get that duo fights have been a massive pain in the ass for most of us. I wasn't particularly appreciative of having to fight the same two foreskin iterations twice barely within a couple of hours of each other, just under some slightly different circumstances. In one encounter, you fight one and then the other, and in the actual duo encounter, you fight both at the same time! Wow, what a, what a gnarly idea. I think the way the concept of 2v1s are handled has probably been the single most criticized facet of the entire game since launch, specifically the godskin duo at Faramazula. So, so much was missing from this fight that I just found it insufferable, but not for the reasons a lot of people also thought that. I was certainly tired of having to heal and immediately hearing someone behind me priming up their napalm grenade, but I was expecting some cinematic payoff at the end where one goes full Kirby mode and just eats the other alive and absorbs his power, and now I have to fight the, 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 go the godskin archbishop or whatever the fuck. And I remember how disappointed I felt slowly realizing that wasn't going to happen. I'm hating myself even as we speak because the length at which I'm talking about this fight means I'm gonna have to capture a good bit of footage for it, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep going. There was a lot missing here. And I think FromSoft knew that from the beginning, because they gave us Placidus Axe immediately afterwards just to make sure we didn't get too mad. This could be a huge potential chance for FromSoft to attempt a real gamer move here and actually trick us into enjoying duo fights. Some of my favorite bosses in Souls were 2v1s. The Two Demons in the Ring City DLC was a cool duo fight. Lothric and Lorien? Duo fight. Shadows of Yarnum was a goddamn triple gangbang 
and Bloodborne still found a way to make that shit interesting. Because if you wail on one of them too much, they all start groaning like they got food poisoning and then summon giant copperheads from the ground. So I, I know they're capable of coming up with something of that tier, and I think they might have their chance with Godwin and Mikola. This is all completely baseless, and I'm fully prepared for the DLC to come out and just make me look stupid for claiming this, but I believe the relationship between Mikola and Godwin offers FromSoft a slam fucking dunk of an opportunity to make the single best 2v1 fight any fan of these games will ever witness. Godwin was always painted up to be the fighter of the two, being strong enough to take down a lich dragon, yet sportsman enough to give him a good old GG afterwards, whereas Mikola's talents lie more in the area of manipulation and charm. He's apparently so drop-dead gorgeous that the entire Albanoric race sees the Halic Tree as a sort of promised land. Whole-ass squadrons of soldiers would literally act as unalive bombers, flinging themselves at enemies after ingesting a potion that allowed them to explode on behalf of the return of Mikola. This dude could just wave his hand and completely strangle your sense of being. I feel like this would make him a massive nuisance even by himself, but his power of abundance and growth, evidenced by the Abundance Twin Blade, which was a weapon cut from the game, could also give those close to him special boons, healings, buffs, whatever the situation calls for, I guess. From a gameplay perspective, Godwin would essentially spend the entire fight with a pocket healer. You could try and go for a spirit summon and maybe Mikola does a little gesture, like Don't Jedi mind trick with his hand or something, and suddenly your own summon is beating the shit out of you. Another popular bit of speculation going around is that we would have to face Mikola and Melania as a potential duo because they're twin Empyreans. I think this would not be a very good idea. That that's it. That that's the that's the whole point. Godwin controlled the power of Golden Lightning, cited in the description of the Death Lightning incantation. I haven't the slightest idea what you could do to make Death Blight any kind of viable in PvE, because being afflicted means literally death, which means no one would ever use anything else. That said, Death Lightning is also a Dragon Cult incantation, and despite feeling like that particular school of magic is already a tad oversaturated, I'm excited to see what other Dragon Cult related weapons and incantations we could potentially be seeing as a result of Godwin when just existing as a character in the DLC. Specifically, the application of this Golden Lightning. Much like Sleep and Death Blight, Golden Lightning is also a pretty scarce appearance. This is one of only two incantations that describe itself as Golden Lightning, the other being Golden Lightning Fortification, which, unlike Death Lightning, has no mention of Godwin anywhere, and instead focuses on the ancient dragon Gransax and the dragon war that followed after he attacked Landell. I think rather than having more Death Blight related options and magic and whatnot, we might actually see an increasing number of options and ways to defend yourself against it. Subsequently, that might mean the enemies of the DLC are more likely to make Death Blight a recurring threat, and not just when you get sneezed on by someone with an uprooted tree for a face. We have some help here and there already. We've got the Prince of Death Talismans, the Pillory Shield, and Grave Scythe, but some status ailments like Frostbite and Scarlet Rot involve negative effects that can still be removed during the point at which you're afflicted. And I've heard it's notoriously hard to cleanse yourself of Death Blight when you're a corpse. So with ailments like Death Blight and Blood Loss, resistance boosting items and tools become significantly more important, if only because the consequences of being afflicted are that much more severe. The way things are shaping up, it seems like sleep and death will be the two main status afflictions that are most likely to involve other facets of the game surrounding it, as well as lightning and holy damage types evidenced by the Abundance Twin Blade and Godwin's likely appearance. But I think there's one particular point of contention a lot of people are just skimming over, which is Mikola's power of abundance and growth. That's the whole context behind all the wheat fields surrounding Mikola in the DLC's reveal art. The Lands Between doesn't convey the same level of flourishing that's seen in this photo, and while I'm not exactly too keen on the idea of theming an entire legacy dungeon around the fact that food grows there, it's a nice detail to bear in mind for what the rest of the area could look like. I keep repeating the notion of there being like a sleep theme or a death blight theme in the undertones of the DLC, but it's not like it necessarily needs to be pigeonholed into a single idea. The mountaintops, I think, had a great way of juxtaposing the threat of frostbite with enemies that excelled in dealing fire damage, and although the design of Kaled has a dominant influence of rot and poison, running into different damage types isn't uncommon. I was prepared for fire to be the main threat when I saw the giant dad chariots hanging out with the exploding corpses, and it's established pretty early on that fire was used as a weapon against Rod. But no, th there's just this whole ass derelict town smack in the middle of the swamp that used to teach sorceries to people. Like what the fuck? 
Point is, I do think a sleep-themed area would be cool to explore, especially considering Mikola's dream world is a possible future location, but I also feel like they're less likely to hold themselves to a specific theme and instead just sink all their efforts into whether or not it feels fun to ride around in. We've also heard talk of a spirit realm somewhere in the universe and the existence of something called a Helfen, which is apparently responsible for guiding the dead of the spirit realm and making sure they don't get distracted by a, a squirrel or something. It, it's basically the FromSoft iteration of Helheim. This honestly isn't that out of Godwin's wheelhouse. If this gets extended upon, we could also be looking at an expansion of another underappreciated school of magic, the Ghost Flame Arsenal. Remember when I said copy-pasted bosses were likely the single most criticized aspect of how Elden Ring was made? Well, that comment gave me two reactions. Emphatic nods of affirmation, and crowds of people gesturing at all the catacombs and caves in the game while putting their hands up in a what-the-fuck motion. What's that? Oh, looks like the Minnesota sink pissers just scored another field goal. Bitch, that's the biggest reason everyone felt like the catacombs were a waste of time in the first place. Every random cave signaled this internal coin flip, whether the further down you went, the more you started wondering if it was going to be another duelist, or another watchdog, or another black knife or a, f a fucking bear. Criticism regarding the blandness of dungeon crawling and the repeated bosses found in them could be an opportunity for FromSoft to actually give more attention to these experiences, is, is all I'm saying. The layout of the catacombs weren't exactly what I would call varied, but a lot of them did have a really unique presence that you couldn't really feel in most others. The idea of raising up a light to shine on shrouded enemies I thought was kinda cool. Riding up a wall by standing on the tip of a guillotine and actually finding something at the top, or beating a boss and realizing there's an elevator at the end of the room that takes you up to an overhead view of Rhea Lucaria. But I don't think it's the layout by itself that so many people had an issue with as much as it was the purpose, you know? At a certain point, going out of my way to explore catacombs just because there was a cool item that could help me out later on did get a bit exhausting. And once I'm on ulcerated spirit number 12, the items I'm finding feel less like incentives and more like damage control. I think what would be amazing is if they started treating catacomb areas more like transitional passages sort of like what they did with Path to the Halic Tree. I think picking up items and spells and upgrades is a nice incentive to at least pay attention to these parts of the game, but I don't think there's a single bigger payoff than going on a splunking expedition for about 10 minutes, barely making it out with a sliver of health, and then just looking up and seeing this giant underground castle the cave was, like, leading me to this whole time. I want to find goddamn Blackreach inside one of these things, okay? That's the real shit.